Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Jagannath Books and the Center of Policy Research, I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of Sham Saran's How China Sees India and the World. I wanted to call the book How China Sees India, and Sham was very insistent that it be called How China Sees India and the World. Um, Mr. Saran needs absolutely no introduction, uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but suffice to say he remains one of our most respected senior diplomats, ex-Foreign Secretary of India, and the reason I think we're all excited about this book is perhaps he's the most foremost authority on China and its relationship with India in our country. China is a country that he has engaged with for over four decades. Um, he's been as a diplomat, as a scholar, uh, as a student of its language. And so this is a book in a way that we've all been waiting for. It's his distillation of all his understanding, all his knowledge, all his experience of this great, big, bad China. And in particularly, what its relationship with is to India. What, you know, one of the things that Cham does here, which is sort of so outstanding, is that he doesn't write this book just as a diplomat. He writes this book also as a historian, and he takes a long view. And we start, and the first part of this book starts with a great big sweep, looking at India and China's interactions from the age of the Buddha down to the Silk Road, road trade and the medieval ocean, ocean trade. And then it comes to the present day. And the early history I found particularly riveting, uh, not just because there are sort of extraordinary nuggets of stories and anecdotes that most of us won't have heard of. I didn't, for example, know about India's connection with chopsticks or that the word dhan and zen are connected. They're really the same word. And then as, Ch as Sham comes to the present day, he's, of course, much more argumentative, much more polemic. And he makes an argument that unsettled me and I think will unsettle everyone who reads this book. And he says very simply that China has profound contempt for India. And this contempt really starts in the 19th century. It's, it's not, and, and has been amplified as China has gained its ascendance over the world. It's a disquieting argument, but he makes it so powerfully and so pow persuasively and with so much erudition that you will close this book agreeing with him and wondering what, it, what this means for the future of India and China's relationship. I certainly didn't leave this book feeling optimistic, but perhaps as a diplomats aren't allowed to be, feel positive or optimistic, they have to maneuver the real world, try and get what they can, uh, and as someone who is a publisher and a lay, lay person who is not a diplomat, perhaps I can afford to feel optimistic or pessimistic. Today, Sham will be in conversation with Suhasini Haider, who's the diplomatic editor of The Hindu. And before I ask them to come on stage, may I please ask our chief guest, Mr. Hamid Ansari, who is our ex-vice president of India, to come on stage and say a few words. Mr. Ansari, please. And before that, please do put your phones on silence. I'm sorry to come up. This is going to be a fascinating conversation, and so I don't want it to be interrupted. Thank you so much. I didn't deserve this. Oh, of course. Please, sir. So. Thank you. अब जिगर थाम के बैठो मेरी बारी आई हाउस फुल ऑफ फ्रेंड्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन समन सेड इट इज अ फॉली टू बी वाइज वेयर इग्नोरेंस इज ब्लिस एंड देयर इज एन ओल्ड प्रोवर्ब दैट होल्ड्स गुड दैट एन इग्नोरेंट मैन इज अ सोल्जर without weapons both seem to be true of me today i therefore unashamedly seek shelter in the ocean of knowledge represented by my friend ambassador sham saran to whose bait i have succumbed china has been a neighbor throughout history to most of the world its thought process has been an enigma 
to fathom it always a challenge. Ideas on religion and philosophy have flown across centuries through multiple channels. Decades earlier, Rabindranath Tagore had sought in a wider perspective to clear what he called the overgrown weeds of oblivion. But there is one recorded instance of a non-peaceful interaction in earlier times. But the volume before us does not refer to it. Both Professor Romila Thapar and uh, the late lamented Mao Tse Tung refer to a happening during the Tang dynasty, that's around seventh century or so, when a Chinese envoy intervened, an envoy to India intervened with force and successfully on the side of the legitimate heir to the throne in the period immediately after the death of King Harsha. Most people of my generation have been familiar with a book called Red Star Over China and with other works on the Chinese Revolution and the writings of Professor Joan Robinson and more recently of Martin Jacques. Some years back, Shri Prem Shankar Jha penned a volume focused on the emerging market economies in our two countries. In the year 2013, the India International Center sought to close what it called the Himalayan Gap by publishing an edited volume on Chinese perceptions of India. And more recently, last year, Professor Kanti, Desai, Kanti Bajpai explored the dimensions of the adversarial relationship described as cold peace. Here lies the importance of the volume before us. It is a geostrategic study of Chinese power as expressed in different times. Particularly interesting is the description of the naval expeditions of Admiral Zhuang Ho, I hope I can pronounce it right, in the 14th century, touching in its ambit the port of Calicut and other trading junctions in the Arabian Sea, lending support to the contemporary claim of a naval tradition. Our author's purpose is expressed candidly. To resist China's effort to see India slotted into a subordinate role in Asia dominated by itself and for this purpose, develop a deeper understanding of China's rising power. He accepts, and I quote him, the most difficult challenge for India is to accept the expanding asymmetry of power with China. Even while China is simultaneously shrinking the gap, it still suffers vis-a-vis -vis the world's supereminent power, the United States. India can meet the challenge, this is the perceptions of the author, on its evident assets, but these are being devalued by the rise of narrow nationalism, the deliberate stoking of communal discord, and the attempt to put a monochromatic frame over a diverse country. Mr. Shamsaran's argument has, Mr. Shams argues that India has a better chance 
of meeting the Chinese challenge by remaining committed to its own values enshrined in the Constitution and pioneering a strategy of growth which is essentially more sustainable. And he concludes by saying that the race is not yet over. Thank you very much. Have I said my piece? Uh, Sham Suhashini, if you could come on stage, we'll do an official launch of the book with Mr. Ansari. Ansari, if you could stand here. I also. Yes. Sham. Mr. Ansari, everyone will want to see you. I also want to be here. Yes. All right. There we are. Hello and welcome all um, once again. Uh, for this discussion, I really had to think very hard about how to pitch this because, you know, there are so many, there is so much discourse about China. The question is how much the person who you are speaking to already knows about it. Uh, and I think uh, as we gather to discuss a book uh, that has in about 240 pages, and I presume that's as much a credit to you as it is to your editor, um, really sums up volumes and volumes of Chinese history, and then gives it this very uniquely Indian perspective, uh, while it also tells you very much about how China deals with the world. Um, I do think that it's necessary to, in a certain sense, go through it chronologically. What's really interesting about this book is it actually begins with the chronological history looks at China over the centuries, but also looks at what India was doing at that time over the centuries. And as uh, it goes along, and I hate to use a television term, but busts myths along the way uh, on things that a lot of us thought were taken for granted. You know, um, as um, Mr. Ansari said, the idea of the Silk Road or China's maritime uh, predominance in the world, uh, these are all uh, ideas that Mr. Saran really challenges. Uh, what happened in India from, and China actually, from 2000 BC to the present. So we're talking about 40 centuries and all, and ending quite literally where we are today. There's even something about the war in Ukraine. There's even something about the upcoming BRICS summit. Um, so I do want to start by asking you, Ambassador Saran, uh, we all read this interview you did today in the Indian Express, uh, where you said on Ukraine that China, for all, you know, all that everyone says is all this strategy and thinks through everything a thousand times, that China has essentially made the wrong bet on Ukraine. I also ask this because, of course, if you look at it, on the top of it, China and India made some very similar choices when it comes to the war in, you, uh, in Europe. Neither have criticized India. Both of them are going to take part in a summit with the Russian president this month. Um, and uh, neither is following sanctions by the West. Uh, we heard from the Home Minister himself today in another editorial uh, who said India's non-alignment is a foreign policy uh, that is, is, is uh, keeping this government in good stead when it comes to Russia. So do you think China has made the wrong bet, and by extension, has India also made the wrong bet? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sohasni. Um, and I would like to thank uh, former Vice President and so many of my peers who are, who are uh, gathered here today. Thank you very much for being here. Um, if you recall, uh, before uh, actually the war uh, erupted, uh, in one of my articles I had said that if in 1972, if the <clears throat> US did a China on Russia, 
uh, it would be fair to say that now China was doing a Russia on the US. Um, because the, uh, I, I think the Chinese perception was since the last several years, and if you look into Chinese writings, this comes out very clearly, that uh, the United States of America is in terminal decline. Uh, and Xi Jinping had said, we are seeing changes unseen in a century. But what is very important is that the balance of power is, has changed irreversibly. I mean, the word irreversible is very important. Uh, and that the West is in complete disarray, you know, with Brexit, uh, the uh, Europeans are not, uh, you know, uh, united together. Therefore, this is our moment. And uh, Russia, uh, if you look at the February for joint declaration by Russia and China, uh, that's really the blueprint for uh, the new world order. And this is the first time you see, for example, China saying something it has never said before. Why would you take on the Europeans with whom you have such good relations? who actually have not been following the United States direction with regard to you know, uh, opposing China. And here is China saying, uh, along with the, with the Russians, that you know, the expansion of, of uh, NATO uh, is something which China also opposes, which has never done this before. Uh, so I think if you take these into account, the Chinese perception and also the Russian perception was that we are now, this is our moment. This is our moment. Uh, and we should press our advantage. Now, this is where I think making that bet with the Russians, uh, that is the bet which I believe has gone wrong. Uh, because uh, many people say you should uh, not really uh, predict a Russian you know, defeat. I'm not predicting a Russian defeat, but it is my genuine you know, judgment uh, that Russia has lost this war. Why has, this lo has lost this war? Because if it is going to leave Ukraine in a complete rubble, what has that done for Russia? Secondly, if the idea was to prevent the further expansion of NATO, nearer Russian borders, has it not achieved already the opposite? With, with Sweden and Finland actually on the threshold of joining uh, NATO. So what could be actually a rational objective that has been achieved? And to the extent those are not being achieved, the bet that China has made on Russia yes. and on what the new world order will look like, I think that bet has gone wrong. All right. Um, now that we've got the end of the book out of the way, I'm going to go back and, and start right at the beginning. Um, and, and there are so many uh, illustrative examples that you give of these things. Uh, Chiki referred to some of them in her introduction. Uh, you speak really uh, much more about the similarities between India and China to begin with, but then the historical differences. For example, one very interesting uh, idea that you put into this book is that while China really uh, is a visual culture, a visual civilization, written uh, civilization, Indians are more about oral and audio and shruti. Um, explain that. Yeah, so I have tried to uh, demonstrate in the book that Chinese culture, uh, to understand Chinese culture, you have to understand Chinese writing. Because, uh, you know, Chinese culture and civilization has developed along with its own script and its language. Uh, as you know, or perhaps many people do not know, that China does not have an, uh, an alphabet. Chinese does not have an alphabet. Uh, it does not have a grammar, uh, rules. Um, these are the characters which China uses. Each character is a word. And each the character which you see today is derived from some pictorial symbol in the past. Uh, so a horse actually really looked like a horse uh, originally. And then over a period of time evolved into something that you see uh, today. So Chinese culture has developed along with that script. What is different between China and India is that there were multiple languages in China multiple dialects, but the written was the same. 
Written script was the same all across. So when I was studying Chinese, uh, what I would speak in Beijing would be unintelligible if I used that language in Guangzhou, in the south. They would not understand me. But I could write what I wanted to convey, and they would understand. In India, if you look at the uh, role of Sanskrit, classical Sanskrit was written and was spoken the same everywhere, because there were very strict rules about you know, how you should, how you should uh, pronounce various words. So whether you were speaking Sanskrit in, in some uh, kingdom in the north of India or in somewhere in Southeast Asia, it would be the same. But it could be written in different scripts. You could be written in Brahmi script. You could be written, writing it in uh, you know, Karoshti. You may be writing it in Devanagari. So this is a complete reversal, isn't it? I mean, on China, in Chinese side, you see script being the unifying factor. And that is what, in fact, explains why there is a greater sense of identity in China rather than uh, in, in India. Uh, so this is uh, important. It, this is not to say that we do not have similarities as Asian cultures. So to give you a very pedestrian uh, example, when I was uh, studying uh, Chinese in uh, Hong Kong, uh, many of my teachers were uh, you know, people who had come away from Beijing or from northern China during the anti-rightist movement or even before that in 1949, uh, they belonged to a somewhat aristocratic kind of uh, level. And they spoke very, very, you know, uh, shall I say, uh, Chinese, which was uh, of a very high, high class. Uh, something like Laknavi, uh, you know, Urdu, I would say. So the, after I had been in uh, school for about six months, uh, I invited one of my very good teachers, a very elegant, you know, lady, old lady. I said, Mrs. Chan, her name was, will you please come to my place uh, for a simple dinner? And her response was, no, 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 no. How can I possibly have this honor uh, of a banquet at your great dwelling um, that I simply do not deserve this? So my answer to that was, no, no, uh, you know, it would be a great you know, privilege for me to host you and to give you any, some simple dishes uh, that will be there at my place. Uh, I hope you can make it. So this conversation went on for about five minutes, her saying, no, 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 I don't deserve this. My saying, please, you must come. Finally, after, after this exchange, she said, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. I will come. And then when I was going away, she stopped me. And she said, uh, Mr. Sanan, I want to tell you something. This is actually the first time I'm going to a student's place for dinner. So I said, how is that possible? You are such a popular teacher amongst us. And she said, I never get beyond the first or second <laughs> sentence. <laughs> because when I say, no, 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 it is too much trouble, they say, OK, some other time. <laughs> but, but I remember that uh, this is something you wrote about in how in India my, sees I, I the remember, world uh, in your first book. And I remember thinking that is very so much that is, like. That is something like, like India, us, isn't it? I mean, it is, very easy for, it is very easy for Indians uh, to understand that. But just to take this one step forward, if you will allow me. Difference. So when I was again studying Chinese, while I was supposed to be a reasonably good student, my teacher would always say, why can't you get this one concept right? Which was the term used for day after tomorrow and the term used for day before yesterday. So the day after tomorrow in Chinese was the reverse day or the day which is at the back. And the day, uh, if you were talking about day before yesterday, you were saying the front day. So I would always get it wrong because, you know, in my mind, uh, the future was in front of you, the past was something behind you, and this was completely reversed. So um, when she told me, uh, she got a little frustrated and said, I cannot understand why you can't get this right. Uh, isn't this very easy to understand? So I, in a very supercilious kind of a way, said, you know, well, in most places, you know, uh, future is in front of us and the past is behind and, you know, this is rather strange. And she says, oh, but this is more logical. And I said, how can this be logical? She says, the past is something that you have always ex already experienced. You have already seen it. So logically, it is in front of you. 
<laughs> it is the future which you have not seen and therefore logically it is behind you. So what is so difficult to understand? Yeah, I would have given the simple explanation of Parso being Parso, you know, and Aane Wala Kal and Bita Gaya Kal. Um, so there are all these, uh, these anecdotes in the book, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you as the readers to really enjoy and cherish each one of them. I, I mean, I found so many little uh, ideas in there, the idea that you can protest about, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, leaders by using simply homophonic uh, words. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so when uh, the, uh, in um, 1989, as you know, the famous Tiananmen riots took place where the students had revolted. Uh, and uh, Tan Xiaoping, who until then was a very popular leader, overnight became uh, a, a, a person who was uh, uh, supposed to be a political villain, who was trying to you know, suppress the students. Uh, so they were, uh, they started throwing bottles on, on, onto the square and saying da, uh, um, da, uh, what was it, uh, yeah, to, 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 uh, the, the term which they were using was, uh, da ping, which ping is a bottle. So Tang Xiao Ping was, this was that, you know, by throwing the bottles on the ground and saying da ping, you were actually uh, saying beat up, uh, you know, Tang Xiaoping. Uh, so it would be couched in, in you know, these, these uh, terms because Chinese language is very, can be, you know, you can have lots of punning with the, with the terms that you use. Uh, so a lot of the political discourse is sometimes carried on in these very, you know, esoteric kind of terms. And unless you understand Chinese, and unless you understand sometimes uh, Chinese legends or Chinese history, sometimes it is difficult to decode this, which is one of the reasons why it's not so easy to understand what is being, being conveyed. All right. Um, another one of the, the, the ideas in the book is this idea that China is essentially reimagining narratives of the past, that it is rewriting history, uh, not just in a way that, of course, we refer to the rewriting of history here, uh, but in creating this entire idea of themselves through that written word. Because if you only have this written word to go by uh, when you're looking at uh, a, a historical uh, detail, uh, then, uh, you know, then it, after a while, it just, it, it trickles into the global consciousness in effect, in effect. And I'll give you some of the examples in the book. Uh, you talk about how uh, in the Song Dynasty, I think, there was a single tr uh, trader who had um, uh, visited the Byzantine. And, Byzantine. Uh, and and uh, uh, it ended up being written as if he had conquered the area, or that it was a vassal no, that, state. That it was a vassal state, representative from a vassal state, state who was coming to pay homage, homage. Uh, to the emperor. So that he, he was a sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, a sort of, uh, it was, it, it was a, um, something that showed the Byzantine as a, a vassal state to them, or on Tibet, where you make the very important point there, that until 1951, actually, China had not if you look at it theoretically, claimed Tibet as part of it, even though this is something that they say in official language. I think they've said it. You know, well, the they, they have claimed uh, Tibet. It's not that uh, the claim wasn't there. But what I have tried to uh, argue is that there was not much legitimacy to that uh, claim. So for example, the Chinese uh, narrative would say that uh, you know, from the uh, uh, 8th century, um, already uh, China or the Thang Empire had become an ally of the uh, Tibetan Empire under the uh, Emperor Strong Sen Kampo. Uh, and that, um, you know, since then, and, and that it was, it was Strong Sen Kampo who wanted, you know, to be accepted as part of the Chinese. Because he married empire. a hot Chinese. Uh, well, he, uh, he not only he attacked, but he, uh, you know, drove the uh, Chinese forces away from the capital, Chang'an. You know, and he imposed <laughs> actually a peace treaty on uh, the Thang dynasty, which is recorded in, uh, you know, the, the, the stone pillars, for example, in Lhasa. You can see the, so that was a treaty. And it was the Chinese empire which was paying tribute to the Tibetan uh, king. 
you know so it was not as if you know this was the this was the time from which china uh, tibet had uh, become a part of uh, of uh, china uh, so there is there is this uh, kind of uh, history being rewritten to somehow demonstrate that tibet has always been a part of china recent in fact uh, his, historical uh, you know essays that you see today are saying it doesn't matter if there are periods where the central government was not you know uh, the the authority ruling uh, tibet because organically what we have today as chinese territories have always been a part of china even if they were not under central government control. So you have this very strange kind of, you know. Looping logic, yeah. even though the Mongols, as you point out, the Manchus, yeah. none So, uh, you know, like India being uh, a country which has been, you know, enslaved for so many years amongst, uh, you know, under the Mughals, then the British, uh, you know, part of the slavishness that we see in India is because of that. Through half its own history, China has been under alien rule. You know, when the Indian freedom movement was taking place, there was a movement in China against the Manchu rule because it was regarded as an alien rule. You know? So, I mean, these things are brushed sort of over. Uh, and that is why you get a narrative which may, most Indians do not understand what is happening. Which is the reason why I wrote this book, because it is important for us to understand. I'm not saying everything about China is critical, but I'm saying that there is a certain history that we should know if we want to understand and to really deal with China. And I do want to come to the roots, and, and, and Chiki referred to it, of course, of, of this sort of contempt. In fact, at one point, they referred to Timur Lane's um, uh, ransacking of Delhi and moving on as half a war between India and yeah, China. Quite right. Whereas, you know, of course, I mean, they were getting ravaged more, much yeah. more by, by him than we were. <laughs> um, another interesting idea I thought was where you talk about the century of humiliation, which of course was first referred to in 1915. So when China today refers to the century of humiliation, perhaps they were referring to. Well, Two today centuries. they are referring to uh, the um, uh, starting from the 19th century, in particular the Opium Wars. Right. Uh, from the Opium Wars onwards to 1949. Uh, so 1842 was the first Opium War. Going up to 1949, when they say China was liberated, this is the period of humiliation, <laughs> you know, the century of uh, humiliation. humiliation. Uh, in the earlier period, yes, uh, they, were, they were looking at century of humiliation uh, in a slightly different uh, time frame, but the fact is that they now very much look at that particular period and say that this is an aberration. It's a historical aberration in what is seen as a continuous history and a glorious history of growth from the ancient times to the present. So China has always been that central empire. It has always been that center of culture and civilization. But it is only during this particular period that it has been you know, under semi-colonial rule. And what is happening today is China just going back to where it was. This is something inevitable. This is something natural. Interesting, because there are also contradictions. Uh, for example, Zheng He, if I'm saying yeah, it correctly, the, uh, the admiral, the admiral yeah. very, very uh, famous personality. He was, I think, a eunuch. He was, yes. uh, he was a Muslim, and yes. uh, he went out and, and you know, ca carried out these uh, during the Ming, Ming, da Ming, Ming dynasty. Dynasty yeah. carried out uh, these uh, sort of treasure hunts almost, and came back sometimes with conquests, sometimes with riches, um, and. Uh, in fact, after he did his third conquest, I think came back. Uh, they, they they stopped all China's maritime. Uh, this was seven voyages altogether, and the uh, after the last voyage, because these were very expensive, uh, they were a great drain on resources. Uh, the uh, the Chinese bureaucracy at that time was really looking at the land you know, frontiers as the main area of threat. You know, there was not no, no threat perceived from the maritime uh, side. Uh, there were also, you know, palace intrigues because they did not like eunuchs playing such yeah, an important such political role. So for a variety of reasons, uh, not only were the voyages stopped, but the shipyards where these huge ships were being made, 
those shipyards were then were demolished. And interestingly, when and all maritime charts which had been prepared right. for over you know several decades, because don't forget, it is not only during the Ming Dynasty that the maritime power of China began. It actually goes back to the Song Dynasty. Right. And it goes back to the Song Dynasty because the caravan routes through Central Asia had been blocked because of conquest by the by the. Sounds like yeah. the maritime silk so road versus. So then they started the... really focusing attention on the maritime, and maritime commerce became very important, and even continued during the Mongol Yuan Dynasty. So I have given the instance of Ibn Battuta, you know, who uh, is being sent. Uh, by Tukluk, Mohammed bin Tukluk to China on a mission. And uh, he goes to Calicut uh, to get onto one of these Chinese ships to go to China. And he then describes that particular ship. And it's incredible, you know, the technology which you see, the size of the ships, uh, it is, is something unprecedented. Uh, so uh, this, there, there is actually nearly 300 years of China being a maritime power. And that is what I have said, if that had continued, right. you know, maybe history would have been different. And yet they kind of wiped out that portion of their history for several hundred years. Changa was hardly known about. It is only during the reform period in the, in the 20th century uh, that uh, Liang Qichao, who is one of the reformers, actually then brought Changa back into, into, uh, and, and, and more recently, as uh, President yeah, Xi Jinping sure. began the Blue Water sure. Navy, I remember when they first sent out these uh, goodwill voyages to the Maldives, it was yeah. not since Chang'e that yeah, somebody right. had come. Uh, then you come to the idea of uh, China's preeminence in Asia, its influence around the world. And you make the point, and I'm still trying to figure out the, the counter to your, uh, your point there, that in fact it was India, not China that had more of an influence in the rest of Asia. Uh, even if you look at things like Hinduism, Buddhism particularly in China, uh, that spread. Confucianism did not spread to India. Uh, in fact, you, you speak about a possible quote that came from Confucius that may have referred to the Buddha. To the Buddha, yes. I mean, I, it's a vague, vague sort of reference, but uh, uh, it could be. But the point that uh, I was trying to make was, uh, that yes, China had a brilliant civilization. Uh, it was a culture and civilization which had its attractions uh, for some of the countries in the region. Most directly the influence, for example, on Korea, you see the influence on Japan, you see the influence on Vietnam, which was under Chinese occupation for quite some time. You know. uh, but beyond what I call a Sinosphere, where you see the impact of Chinese culture with the rest of, say, Southeast Asia or countries which are closer to India, the influence of India and Indian ideas, India, Indian religions, Hinduism to begin with, Buddhism uh, later on, these were far more extensive, far more deep-rooted uh, than Chinese influence. So not to say that China did not have a kind of a cultural sphere, but that cultural sphere was more limited than uh, what was the Indian sphere. And then I come to the myth busting, if you like, that uh, that really struck me, where you speak about the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and you actually say that this is an in in imagined history being put forward to seek legitimacy for China's claim to Asian hegemony. Now these are very strong words. Um, why do you say that the Silk Road, according to most people, was something that saw, you know, this, it, it came from silk, uh, that came from China? So where does, where does this idea So come? this is where, you know, a narrative takes hold, and then people start, you know, imagining that this is the way history was. So, uh, yes, uh, silk was traded on the Silk Road. Number one, there was not one Silk Road. You know, there were a network of routes across Central Asia, Persia, India, which formed part of those ancient network. Not only silk was being traded on this. You know, Indian cottons, for example, were very popular. At, for several hundred years, actually, Indian cottons were the currency for trade with Southeast Asia. So the, the uh, trading networks that were 
for example, if you are looking at who actually controlled some of the trading networks across Central Asia, not the Chinese. It was the Sogdians who were related, uh, a, a uh, ethnic group related to the Persians. And they were the middlemen. So China was, in fact, a, in, on the periphery, trading goods, but through these intermediaries. A lot of the Chinese goods actually found their way to, say, the Roman Empire, not directly through the land route, but many of them came through the, uh, these caravan routes to Indian ports like, the, uh, like um, Broch, for example, Barikaza, as they were called, or down to Calicut itself. You know, uh, and then were exported to uh, to uh, the Roman uh, to the Mediterranean. Uh, so, if you are really looking at history, I would say that India was far more on the crossroads of both the caravan routes as well as the maritime routes. So, in that sense, if you are looking for some centrality, I would say has greater greater claim to centrality than China. But because silk was one of the goods that was traded, and you know it was a German geographer who actually gave, gave the name Silk Road, and since then it became as if this was, you know, the the this uh, the all these uh, trade routes had China at the center. China was not at the center. That is the reality. So when China is saying the Belt and Road is nothing but you know the old Silk Road coming back into action again. That's simply not true. Yes, what China is doing today is quite spectacular in terms of rewiring the world in a sense, uh, through highways, railroads, digital highways. That's certainly true, as you said, major maritime power today. So all these are of recent origin. You don't claim legitimacy by harking back to something which did not exist in the past. All right. Uh, interesting, and you have a you, you will have a very interested audience uh, while reading through some of, uh, some of these ideas that you have challenged. Uh, then we come to the idea, and I'm trying to now skip through a few because I know that many of you will have questions from Ambassador Saran as well, uh, is the idea, and this lends itself a little bit to what Shiki said of the contempt of India, of seeing India as a negative example, an example not to be followed. Uh, and you give many examples, as you just said. In the Opium Wars, for example, it's well known that Indians created a negative image in the Chinese mind because they came as, as British soldiers. Uh, do you think that is perhaps the first area where you see this, this, uh, this uh, contempt, if you like? I, I don't like the word, but I can't think of a, a better one at this moment. Uh, taking seed in yeah. the Chinese mind. So let me nuance that a bit. I would not say that this is just a complete you know, sort of black uh, perception of India. It is more ambivalent. Ambivalent because in Chinese consciousness also is the awareness of an ancient history where India was, in a sense, the center of culture, the center of knowledge. Uh, this was the one country which did not quite fall into that mandala of China that, you know, China is the cultural center and there are concentric circles of less and less civilized countries. India did not fall into that uh, category because it was a country which was itself a center of culture and civilization. And Buddhism was very much part and parcel of that awareness. Uh, the, uh, the imbalance here is that China was very much interested in India, but you don't find the same interest in India about China. Even today? Even today. You know, that's one of the, one of the things that I point out in the book, that there is simply no interest there in understanding. Chinese studies. And yeah. So the, uh, the uh, difference is that partic that particular period came to an end around 1080. When Buddhism itself, which was um, the main vehicle of contact between the two countries, itself diminished and then died in India, basically. So that Buddhist connection became less and less important. So as I have said, China developed its own Buddhist universe uh, thereafter. But uh, also what happened was that because of the invasions which took place uh, into India, the Muslim invasions which took place, uh, that also interrupted a lot of the 
connections between the two countries. The one thing which was not interrupted was the maritime trade between the countries. So, you know, Malabar coast, the Coromandel coast continued actually to maintain, you know, maritime links with China. But the rest of India and the rest of China became, in a sense, uh, completely ignorant about one another. Right. And the time when India once again emerged on Chinese consciousness was precisely the Opium War, where the foot soldiers of the British. British were Indians. The people who were engaged in a lot of the opium trade were Indians. You know, Bombay as a commercial center, as I have pointed out in the book, actually emerged thanks to the opium trade. It was the big opium traders, the uh, you know, Parsi traders, some of the Marwari traders, who made millions and millions out of the opium trade. And they then set up these huge merchant houses in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, which the Chinese saw was you know, derived from actually the spoliation of China. Let us not forget, there was this terrible spoliation of China which took place uh, during that time. Uh, and we were, unfortunately, <laughs> because we were a colonized country, in some sense, we became associated uh, with that. With that. In fact, this is a recurring theme then, when you talk about uh, the way China looked at India, it was about being a uh, Western imperialism instrument. Uh, even the manner of India's independence, the fact that we kept up the relationship with the British as opposed to the Chinese Revolution or how they saw it, that became a, a, a yeah. big factor in how they saw it. So, I mean, if I see some of the earlier writings on Indian independence in, in, in Chinese, uh, there is, there is a kind of a, you know, suspicion that was this really independence for India? Because, you know, it's strange. India has become independent from the British and the British Governor General continues, is invited to continue as the head of state of India for another year or more. You know, that is unthinkable from the, <laughs> from the Chinese point of view. Or that India continued with the civil service uh, that was put in place by the British or that uh, the British Indian Army uh, actually continued to be the you know, Indian independent Army. India's army. So the suspicion, is this really an independent country? Right, in yeah. fact, they say that to be, uh, to, have, to be owned by the Mughals and then to be owned by the British yeah. uh, really has, uh, uh, you know, is, is what defined India and almost, uh, and you asked the question then, was China similarly not uh, willing to introspect about its own conquest? No, it, 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 is, uh, it is not. But I would say if you put yourself in Chinese shoes and if you if you're looking at the world after having been through this kind of revolution, then the perceptions that these kind of things created in their mind is understandable. Sure. That uh, the other thing is that, you know, in, uh, if you take the independence struggle in India, it would be fair to say that the elite which actually was behind that independence struggle was very much an English-speaking elite, right. you know. So the discourse of independence in India was carried in the English language. What is important to understand is that in China, the discourse about revolution was always carried out in Chinese. You know, and that same script that I said is common all across China was very helpful in creating that kind of national concept. But unlike India, which included all the different pluralities of India, this was a Han revolution. This was not a Tibetan revolution. This was not a Mongol revolution. This was certainly not a Xinjiang you know, revolution. It was very much a Han phenomenon. Yeah, to the point where you even make the, the case that when Chiang Kai-shek met with Gandhi and when he met with Nehru, uh, he was disappointed. Yes. Um, because he, f he felt that Indians should have been ready to up and join allied forces. That's right. That's right. I mean, he, he, he was disappointed because he felt that, uh, you know, at, the, at that particular point in history, uh, even if uh, India was, uh, was uh, you know, involved in this independence movement against the British, the fight against fascism and Japanese imperialism uh, should take priority over this. And he could not understand why uh, somebody like Nehru, who had a sense of history, or Mahatma Gandhi, with whom he spent long hours actually talking about this, were not, were not able to see that. Already the Asia versus the war in Europe. <laughs> 
um, uh, comparisons begin. Uh, and, and then you have these very interesting anecdotes. And the book is really about stringing together so many of these anecdotes uh, about Joe and Lai and Nehru. Because after the, the kind of uh, look at India through this Western imperialism prism, there was also the constant uh, um, uh, suspicion about India's real intentions towards Tibet. And there's this, this lovely idea that uh, Indira Gandhi came out wearing a Tibetan costume, which really upset Joe and Lai. Yeah, so uh, this was in 1954, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, when he was visiting uh, New Delhi, and there was a reception at the Rashpati Bhavan. Uh, uh, no, sir, not 60. This was an earlier period. Uh, this was in the, uh, one of the earlier visits of Chow and Lai. Uh, 54. And uh, this was a reception at the Rashpati Bhavan, where um, you know, Chawne was <coughs> invited. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Indira Gandhi turned up at that reception wearing a Tibetan uh, costume. And not that uh, Chawne said anything at that time, but later on when he's talking to Kissinger, in 1972 That's or 1970. That's the interesting bit, that he's actually telling the US. Uh, he's telling, telling uh, Kissinger that, uh, you know, the Indians are very devious. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went uh, to this uh, reception where, to which I was invited. And, uh, you know, uh, there was this lady who, Lady Lama, who turned up wearing a Tibetan dress. And do you know who it was? And of course, uh, Kissinger is foxed, and he says, Madam Bin, you know, from uh, Vietnam. And he says, no, 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 this is Indira Gandhi. Madam Gandhi. Madam Gandhi, you know. And this was the kind of devious things that Indians could do. That, you know, that Mrs. Gandhi coming out to this reception wearing a Tibetan costume was like saying, Tibet belongs to us. But maybe, <laughs> but maybe it was a message at the time. Because... I, I doubt it, but anyway, I mean, one can, one can uh, you know. Yeah. All right, and then you come to the other ideas of why India as a negative example is pointed out <coughs> when a very senior Chinese uh, uh, business delegation is, I think, in Bodh Gaya and they get stuck in a protest in Bihar. Ah, and they yes. see democracy as this chaotic and unruly thing. Yes. So this is uh, the head of the um, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, which after the Cultural Revolution, they had started, you know, sort of reviving. And there was a very famous uh, sociologist, Chinese sociologist called Ma Hong, uh, who uh, was heading the uh, Academy of Social Sciences. And his was one of the first delegations, high-level delegations, which went to visit India. Uh, a, a delegation of nearly 10 or 15 uh, you know, Chinese scholars and various other people. And they went all around uh, India. And when they came back, I hosted a dinner to the, for them, and I asked them, okay, so what were about your impressions of uh, India? And one of the things he said was, you know, that we were going from Patna airport, we were driving to Bodh Gaya, uh, and uh, suddenly in the, in the middle of the journey, uh, we were stopped because there was a demonstration taking place, and the road had been blocked. And there was a police officer, senior police officer sitting in our car, and uh, we thought he's going to get out and beat up these people. <laughs> and he went out and he was literally praying to them, saying, you know, we have foreign guests, please <laughs> let us go. And, they, you know, these uh, demonstrators then looked at us and says, OK, go. It would have been the opposite way. <laughs> How could this happen? And uh, so, you know, in their mind, and one of the, this is what he said to me, he said, our impression was, how can this chaotic country uh, actually manage to manage to survive? You know, this is the question we keep asking ourselves. So, I mean, you know, that is that is uh, that is that bewilderment about India. All right, and then finally, of course, the 1962 war happened. So, what I'm going to do at this point is cut across the century because there's so much to read in this book, and come a little bit uh, to the present, which feels like uh, a, a 90, uh, I mean, that relations have reached levels they did perhaps in 1962. For the last two years, uh, Indian and Chinese soldiers have been ranged against each other. Uh, we saw Galwan and uh, the, the killings of Indian soldiers, some that the Chinese have admitted to, uh, nearly two years to the date. Uh, and Given everything that you have said in the book about understanding how China sees India, how, understanding how China sees the world, what, according to you, explains what we have seen? First, the amassing of troops at the border, 
the Galwan killings, and then the fact that for two years we have not actually been able to find a full resolution and a, and a, a demobilization of troops. You know, it's, it's, uh, I can't give specific uh, maybe reasons why uh, this would have happened, but I can see the backdrop against which this has happened. And uh, I have tried to point out in the book that the, the contrast is uh, from the period that I was, say, Foreign Secretary, but even beyond that and somewhat before that, uh, there was a gap between India and China. You know, we were, we were a smaller economy than uh, China was. But the difference was that during this period, India was growing very rapidly. You know, it was growing at the rate of something like 9 to 10 percent per annum. Chinese economy was slowing down, comparatively speaking. So even though there was this gap all across the world, India was seen as actually shrinking this gap. You know? So this, this was not only the perception in India, but this was the perception across the world, that this is going to be the next China, actually. This is the, going to be the next big commercial opportunity. Also, perceptions which were also derived from the way in which re India reacted, for example, to the tsunami, where despite being hit by itself, but it was one of the first countries to actually get assistance across, relief surprise across uh, to neighboring countries and to Southeast Asia. You know, the Indian Navy was really uh, one of the first navies to do that, which is what led to what today has become the Quad. Because as Foreign Secretary, I was talking to my counterparts from Japan, from US, from Australia, how we could coordinate our naval movements in order to deliver uh, assistance. So there was a sense that here is a country which we have not quite paid attention to that is not only emerging as a major uh, economy, but it is also a country which has considerable force projection capabilities. And this also impacted on Chinese perceptions about uh, India. So then you have 2005 when the Chinese actually sign a joint declaration with you, which talks about you know, uh, cooperative strategic partnership. Uh, they bring a map of Sikkim, which shows Sikkim now as a part of uh, India. India. Uh, there is uh, also a acknowledgement that India maybe should be part of the Security Council, one of the permanent members of the Security Council. Completely different kind of uh, you know, stance towards India. What happens after that is that you have the global financial and economic crisis in 2007-2008. Thereafter, the gap between the US and China, <coughs> China benchmarking itself with the US, sees that gap shrinking. It sees the gap with India no longer shrinking, but becoming much bigger, you know, expanding uh, symmetry. And therefore, I have said that in conversations with Chinese scholars, for example, uh, they turn around and say, you know, our Indian friend should realize we are now five times your size. You know, this will naturally have some impact in the manner in which we take our relationship forward, saying where you should know your place. <laughs> you know, we are now, now much bigger than, 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 than you are. And so, um, as far as the uh, border is concerned, what may have been, in their mind, something that could be solved through a cons consultative process, through, you know, uh, the give and take. Uh, they said, why should we give anything? You know, we are a much larger power. You have to, you know, uh, defer to our, you know, requirements. And therefore, if you are building infrastructure, which is reducing the asymmetry between our forces at the border, you cannot be allowed to do this. You know? So this is specifically with respect to the border issue, but this is in the context of a larger perception that you know we have now, China, as I have said, looks at power hierarchically. Yes. And therefore, when you look at power hierarchically, if there is a country which you have slotted somewhere <laughs> you know, the ranking order and it refuses to stay there, then it has to be taught a lesson. Yeah. So this is the uh, kind of you know, mindset that you see at play. By the way, it is not only with respect to India. 
It is also with respect to other countries. Don't forget, you know, Yang Chie Chiu, who's the, now the state councillor, but who had been foreign minister. At an ASEAN meeting, he turned around and said, yes. you countries, you know, you should know that China is a big country and you are small countries, and that's just a fact. You know, I mean, he was, <laughs> he was quite, you know, angry about it, as if, you know, this is something self-evident and you are not uh, recognizing it. So I think it is important to understand the frame through which uh, they look at the world. Uh, That's why the book is not just about how China looks at uh, India, but also how it looks at the, it the looks world. at the world. And just as there are prejudices that China has about India, which need to be addressed. Similarly, we have lots of prejudices about China, and we have ignorance about China. So if this is going to be the country which is going to be for the foreseeable future, your main challenge, uh, point I'm trying to make is you better understand this country much better than you have done today. And you better not be shutting down language schools and, uh, and, and areas yeah. of study as well. Um, how much is it, and, and you've spoken about this historical concept, you've spoken about the fact that sometimes India knows about itself through the work of Chinese scholars. Yeah. I'm sure I'm saying yeah. onwards. Um, but how much of this is now part of the era of Xi Jinping? and about a personality who, whatever you might say, is not fitting into only just this model, but is also doing things uh, differently, putting the party front and center, uh, not talking about collective leadership anymore, um, putting no, you know, taking off term limits of all kinds, uh, PLA reforms, uh, the crackdowns on Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang, quite the opposite of what had been expected from Xi Jinping. How much of it is about this single personality, this alpha male, if you like, at the time? Uh, like uh, it's usually the case, it is a bit of both. Uh, so it would be wrong to uh, see uh, the way in which uh, Chinese foreign policy and the stance towards the rest of the world has been changing as only due to Xi Jinping. Uh, again, if you read the book, you will see that there has been a certain evolution of Chinese thinking with regard to the world as its own power has, you know, uh, developed. Uh, so, um, ideologically, for example, it is now uh, no longer, it says no longer in a stage which Lan Xiaoping had said, you know, hide your capabilities, hide your light, wait for your moment. Uh, now is the time when you must actually come out and assert your power. Uh, so this is, this is something uh, which, is, which is very clear, but it is not something that uh, Xi Jinping has started. You see this already immediately after the global financial and economic crisis and the change that I mentioned to you came about. If you see the diplomatic work conferences, if you see Chinese writings, this is already clear. So what Xi Jinping is doing is really taking that forward. It is not he who has come out with this. Uh, even the aspect of China, Chinese dream or you know, community of a shared future, these are not concepts which started with Xi Jinping. Uh, but he has given it much more prominence and given it a certain direction. Uh, personal, uh, you know, the, the personality of the leader is very important. But I think also in China, the structure of a Leninist state is much more important, you know. And in the relations with other leaders, if there are people who may feel that, you know, uh, the personal chemistry between the leaders is something which really determines Chinese policy, or Putin and Xi Jinping, you know, it is a personal relationship which really is making, uh, making the difference, up to a point, but not really. I think China looks at this foreign policy in the, very much in the context of what the geopolitical equations are what the balance of power is. That is much more of a determinant than just the personality of the leader. In one respect, he has made changes, which is something that one has to watch in the future. Many of the reforms which Tang Xiaoping was associated with, mostly we think of Tang Xiaoping's reforms as economic reforms, but that's not really true. In fact, very significant political reforms. You know, uh, trying to get away from the Maoist period of, you know, single, you know, dominating leader to a more, more collective leadership, uh, much more, you know, structured uh, transitions of leadership, you know, by 
putting a certain certain uh, age limit or putting a certain term limit on high office. Uh, the uh, separation between the state and the party, that the party is supreme, but in a supervisory capacity. Let the state and the bureaucracy do what it needs to do professionally. Or the professionalization of the PLA, the army. That, you know, the kind of complete intermixing of the party and the armed forces. This had to change because otherwise professionalization of the army uh, would not be possible. It is these very important political reforms which uh, Xi Jinping is trying to reverse. Uh, that is party being uh, central in a much more operational sense, not merely in a, in a supervisory sense. And looking at some of the economic changes as actually threats to the dominance of the party. So, for example, you know, the uh, moves against uh, large multinational companies like Alibaba, which have been a great success, or various other Chinese enterprises who have really driven this high growth rate of uh, China. Why are they being attacked? Because over a period of time, these companies also have very strong patronage links with party leaders. They would not have got to where they are without that political patronage. So, so if there is that connection between big business and you know, the, the party leadership, that is seen as, as being uh, somehow a, a threat to uh, Xi Jinping's position and even the party itself. All right. uh, so there are those elements which are perhaps more important. Okay, and, and, and finally, uh, so that we don't end on that pessimistic note that we're working not only against 40 centuries of a Chinese thought, um, uh, but the present that we are looking at uh, come these recommendations for India. And Ambassador Seren puts them in terms of, uh, you know, India must learn to build more technology, more innovation, use its Western partners uh, better, create the conditions for more in, uh, investment <coughs> flow. Um, and then he comes, as uh, uh, Mr. Ansari said, to that uh, final conclusion that India must not, just as China looked at India as a negative uh, uh, example, India must not draw the wrong conclusions from China's success. Uh, that authoritarianism is in fact not the answer, and he says India has a better ch uh, chance of meeting the China challenge, actually, if it remains committed to the values enshrined in the Constitution. My final question to you before I come to the audience is one, one of the conclusions you come to uh, is to compare what China uh, looked at in, in one particular war, which is that you must win your war by stealing into the mind of the adversary. Tell us what that means. Well, I mean, this is, uh, I, have, I have drawn this from uh, a very famous legend in uh, China, which is uh, very quoted very uh, frequently. Uh, this is one of the generals, uh, Chuga Liang. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this was during the warring state uh, period. And when um, there was a very large rival army, which uh, had actually laid siege uh, to uh, the fort in which he was uh, with a much smaller number of soldiers, uh, it was almost inevitable that this would be overrun. So uh, instead of uh, you know, building up defenses or closing the gates, he told his um, you know, uh, uh, aides, open all the doors, open all the gates uh, to the uh, fortress. Uh, and uh, go about, you know, the soldiers, you dress up in the clothes of ordinary townspeople and you sweep the streets and you, you know, act as if you are uh, tradesmen. And he himself went to the gate, the main gate, and which had an arch, and he sat on the gate and started playing, you know, this Chinese string instrument called the chin. And when the, this rival general came with his masked army, and he saw this man sitting at the top of the gate. He saw that all the gates of the fort were open. He said, there must be some you know, uh, kind of conspiracy here. There must be <laughs> some kind of a, you know, this trick this man is playing on me. Uh, and if I attack, uh, maybe we will, we, will, we will be defeated. Uh, so unless I understand what he's up to, I will not attack. So he actually withdrew. 
uh, and you know, and uh, and managed to manage to save <laughs> save Eventually, his kingdom. Uh, so this is what I'm saying that you know, in terms of what I was trying to say that you should get into the mind of your adversary. Um, you will not be able to get into the mind of your adversary if you do not really seek to understand, uh, you know, your adversary. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you for listening so patiently to that. Uh, I want to come to questions from the audience. Okay. <laughs> I see a lot of uh, uh, hands up. Uh, I'm going to, uh, do you have the mic? Okay, so let's just come right there to the ambassador. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so it's always a pleasure listening to you and I've already got your book with the autograph. You know, regarding this uh, Chinese uh, response to the Ukraine crisis and the, I mean, how they approach their relation with Russia, uh, you know, whatever little I have read in the papers, uh, it seems that uh, the fact that the, uh, I mean, of course, the Chinese public was very thrilled how the uh, sort of uh, the Russians were beating the NATO and everybody else uh, as they were going around in Ukraine. But uh, there was a kind of a sense of, uh, in a way, skepticism or self-doubt as to how a country like China, I mean, this is, I think in the elite perhaps, or the top bureaucracy, as to how a country like China, which is the upholder of multilateralism and international order, should be seen to be supporting uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, I remember reading that uh, this became such an issue that they actually went, uh, in fact, they had to have a theoretical discussion on that as to what were the compulsion as to why Russia actually went to Ukraine. And their discussions in their, you know, the party developed an ideological response, uh, which was that uh, this is actually, in a way, the, the fallout of the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And they go back to the issue of Gorbachev and Perestroika and all the rest of it, as to how, and then, you know, the, the whole series of historical lectures from the Chinese ideological point of view were developed, what they called a historical nihilism of Gorbachev in the way he interpreted the, the, the Soviet ideology. So my point really is that this is how it was, as I could see. So it was actually seen in a way as a validation of Xi Jinping's own approach of building China into a much more ideological state. So that is the kind of sense I got when I was reading some of the reports as to how the discussion taking place at the theoretical level in the Chinese uh, sort of bureaucracy. In it. Thank you. Well, don't make the mistake of thinking that uh, China determines its... Uh, you know, external stance on the basis of just ideology. Mostly it is a very cold calculation of what China's interests are. Then you dress it up ideologically. First you decide what you want to do, what is important. Then you start doing the packaging. And so what you are seeing happening is that effort to package something that China, rightly or wrongly, has decided. Uh, it is in its interest. Uh, to even if the uh, Russians are at this point of time losing, uh, to somehow, you know, uh, rationalize it, uh, both for their, their own uh, people, but also to rationalize it in terms of, you know, their uh, relationship with uh, other uh, countries. But as I said, they made a big mistake. Uh, this is a miscalculation. And it has the potential of reversing a number of gains that China has, uh, has made. Uh, so uh, if you, if you uh, take, for example, the February 4 declaration, first time, it was not necessary at all. For the first time, China starts commenting upon the European situation. Why does it have to be a uh, worry for China that uh, NATO has expanded over the last several years in, in Europe? They have very good relations with Europe. They have very good, uh, you know, uh, very profitable relations with uh, Europe. Uh, why then sign on to a joint declaration which is criticizing and condemning the, uh, the expansion of uh, NATO? And if China believes that this is something which is in its interest, that there should be no further expansion, uh, then I think the whole, whole situation has actually turned 
against them because now you have Sweden and Finland also going to be part of uh, part of NATO. So while many people I know still believe that uh, don't write off the uh, Russians, uh, that you know uh, China is going to to gain from this, I think that. Uh, this is a reversal uh, for China. I may be wrong. I mean, I, I admit that maybe this is speculative, but I believe the way things are actually evolving, it is not evolving in favor of China. Right. Um, well, we'll take one from the middle. I think you had a question. Of, uh, Mr. Nakhbar Singh has a question. In the front front. Of, right in the front. I normally never ask questions in such meetings. But uh, my first posting was in China, uh, so nearly 100 years ago. Uh, now the Indian embassy had to face a very serious problem. The wife of the Indian ambassador fell in love with Chun Lai. He didn't know what to do. The Indian ambassador's wife seriously fell in love with Chun Lai. And he didn't know how to handle it. Is this the origin of all the troubles we are having with China? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. This is where it started. So we don't have to go Secondly, back <laughs> into the when, history. When Chun Lai think... came to India in 1960, I was liaison officer to him. And we blew it. Do you agree? Yes. Yes, I, I, I think so. Uh, so we now have the secret history of India-China yeah. relations. <laughs> How India sees uh, China. There's a gentleman at the back, I think, over there who had a question. Good evening, Ambassador Saran. Uh, the question is about uh, what are your views on uh, President uh, 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 the, the statement made by Antony Blinken on their uh, China strategy? Uh, how is it going to impact the One China policy? And do you think it's a greater threat to Taiwan now? Well, I think, you know, uh, the formal uh, stance that uh, the U.S. has with respect to the Taiwan issue is, as you know, strategic ambiguity. That is, they will not declare whether or not the U.S. will respond militarily if uh, China were to invade uh, Taiwan. Uh, that is the uh, position. It may, it may not. But what has been happening since the end of the Ukraine war is that you see, at least tactically, there is a certain growing uh, pressure, you know, uh, on China by making the strategic ambiguity somewhat less ambiguous. <laughs> I mean, it is not fully changed, but it is moving in a direction which is somewhat less uh, ambiguous. Um, I think there is no doubt that uh, as a result of the Ukraine war and what has been happening, uh, the, uh, the inability of uh, the Russians to actually wrap this up as, as, as quickly as they had anticipated, uh, may be leading to some rethinking in China about, about uh, Taiwan, uh, whether they are really uh, in a position to take Taiwan militarily, even if they were capable of doing so. And the other aspect which also worries them is the sanctions aspect. I mean, they have been quite shocked by the manner in which Russia has been, in a sense, unplugged from the global system. May not happen with China, because China is far more integrated into the global economy than Russia has been. Uh, but that possibility is there. Uh, so that is something which uh, uh, also has has given rise to a certain defensiveness which you see today in China, which is different from what we have seen uh, not in the not so uh, distant past. Quite right. Um, let's take one from this. There's a young gentleman here. Um, thank you for the recognition. Um, I'm a first year student of political science. It's an honor to be here, sir. Thank listening to you. My question really is about something which you've spoken of in the discussion and you've written about it in your book as well. That China's worldview is inherently hierarchical. So even unrest within China was related to a breakdown of central authority, which is something you've pointed out. But on the other hand, sir, the interdependence upon which China's economy thrives 
on the rails of globalization seems to lead to a situation whereby it seems like China is sustaining on the basis of a paradox. It's like there are two contrasting internal foundations. So my question really is, how long is it possible for a society like China to sustain on the rails of a paradox like this? And is it, is, is it the case that the economic growth which is sustaining this particular paradox transcends this hierarchy, pr hierarchy principle which is ingrained in the Chinese worldview and allows this sort of paradox to sustain? Well, China will not be the first country which has faced these paradoxes. <laughs> I mean, a lot of countries have these uh, contradictions. But let me, uh, let me say that uh, with uh, respect to uh, current Chinese prosperity, there is no doubt that current Chinese prosperity is a creature of globalization, is a creature of interdependence. Uh, so uh, even if China today believes that you know, it is somewhat exposed because of this interdependence. Uh, you see, uh, trying to square the circle by, for example, Xi Jinping arguing, yes, we are interdependent, but we should try and create the kind of interdependence where we are less dependent on the rest of the world while we make the rest of the world more dependent on us. So asymmetrical <laughs> interdependence in a, in a sense. Is that possible? Uh, I doubt it very much. Even if it may have, have evolved in that direction, thanks to Chinese behavior during the pandemic, thanks to Chinese behavior even now using uh, the economic relationship as a, as, as a punitive weapon, like they have done, for example, with, uh, with uh, Australia. Uh, I think uh, it, is, it, is, it is not as if the rest of the world will not respond uh, to this. Uh, but yes, there is an effort to try and say, yes, we are interdependent, but we can make it less onerous for us by making the rest of the world more dependent on us uh, than we are on them. Frankly, not possible, but that is the discourse. In fact, you bring that interesting phrase, weaponization of interdependence. There was a lady <laughs> over here who had her hand up. Um, do, can we get a mic to her? Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, sir, I just wanted to ask you, I was briefly going through your book right now, and you've mentioned the unequal treaty, the opium war, and other historical events that have influenced how China looks at India. That is something I haven't seen before because I have studied history. So how far do you think that uh, these ideas, and of course, uh, the, the idea of Tian Chia, and uh, you've mentioned other um, you know, uh, theoretical conceptualizations that China has influenced its understanding of India, if we were to look at very closely. And uh, do you think we have, as a country, failed to understand, maybe we can grasp that aspect and formulate our foreign policy on the basis of certain, by understanding their theoretical conceptualizations better? I think just to add to the young lady here, I'd, I'd like to say, um, if we, uh, you know, as a final question, really, how do you grade India's response? to everything that China has done? Uh, no, so I mean, uh, we have had to respond uh, <laughs> whether we like it or not to uh, the challenges that we have faced. Like for example, uh, if, we, if we take the uh, you know, Kalwan uh, uh, crisis, uh, I do think that the Chinese were somewhat surprised at the, at the kind of reaction that they faced uh, from uh, India, uh, the deployment of very large uh, forces. Uh, whereas they may have thought that in the past we have had these kind of skirmishes, but you know the rest of the relationship we have been able to take forward, that has not been possible this time. Not for want of trying on their part, but I mean, they they also on their side do not seem to understand why this is the case. Uh, so, uh, in a sense, uh, we have responded as I think we best uh, best could, uh, but I think that's not. That's not the way in which uh, we can really, as I said, if we are looking at this as a longer term challenge, uh, you need to do much more. And in that doing much more, uh, your ability to gauge why the, the Chinese are thinking in a manner that they are. It is only when you understand that, that then you can begin to influence that uh, way of thinking. 
But if you do not understand why a certain thought process is evident on the other side, how do you even begin to influence it? You are reactive, yes, you, and maybe you are reacting quite, quite, uh, quite uh, efficiently in a sense, uh, but that's not the answer to the longer term challenge that you face uh, from China. Uh, so uh, again, I would like to end by making that plea that uh, it is extremely important, not only at the level of diplomats, not only at the level of those who are great scholars and doing research in China, uh, they understand maybe. But I think the larger, you know, educated public opinion in India has very little knowledge about China. Even, like for example, I said uh, with respect to Chinese uh, not having an alphabet uh, or having, you know, this, uh, this uh, language uh, through, through characters. How many Indians do understand that? They don't. Uh, so this is why I'm saying that uh, there is a great need uh, for that kind of understanding, a more general understanding of China, so that you can respond uh, to that challenge better. All right, I'm going to end with that Chinese uh, cliche of the journey of a thousand miles, beginning with one step. Certainly, the, the vast journey ahead of us of understanding China uh, does begin uh, a very large step in that is uh, the book you have before you. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much. You've been a great audience, so please give yourself a round of applause as well as for the author. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sham. Thank you very much, Suhasini. Thank you very much, everyone. Our books are on sale. Please buy many copies. And Sham is here to sign them. Thank you very much again for being here.